And our next speaker <coughs> is David Pardo, and he's going to talk about a deep reads method with R adaptivity for solving partial differential equations. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see well the screen and can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Maybe you can put the slides in full screen mode if that's possible. Are they in full screen mode right now? Um, not entirely, but it's, I guess it's also fine like this. Okay, um, right now full screen or not, not yet? No. Okay, anyway, let me start. Um, I'm going to talk about um, an algorithm for R adaptivity for solving PDEs. I will explain what R adaptivity is using a deep read method. So our background is on solving geophysical problems with finite elements. In particular, very interested on given some measurements, solving an inverse problem that is governed by a partial differential equation to determine the main characteristics of the earth, to characterize the earth material properties and so on. Now, critical to that is to solve a forward problem. So because all of this uh, recent trend on solving PDEs using neural networks, we started looking into that. So just to fix ideas, we are gonna select a very simple problem given uh, by a partial differential equation. This is a model equation with corresponding Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. This is on the frequency domain. Here actually is a static problem. The corresponding weak formulation is this one with the corresponding regularity assumptions, which are the typical ones selected in finite elements and general Galerki methods. Sorry, we, we still see the first slide. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm changing from one slide to the other. Then let me see, uh, hold on. Can you see it here now? No, no it's, it's still the first page. Okay, let me show it again and see how it works. No. And now, no. Yeah, now it's perfect. Now it's perfect, okay. So that's what I was saying that uh, I'm really sorry by this, that uh, we, we are interested in geophysical problems. We're interested in solving partial differential equations. And this is our model problem, and which is given by a simple equation. And this is the corresponding weak formulation by integrating by parts, multiplying by test function and so on. And with the corresponding regularity assumptions, okay? So because of this uh, recent trend on uh, using neural networks for solving PDEs, we enter into that world and we start in analyzing what we could do to more efficiently solve these problems with the help of neural networks. So we encounter, for example, the deep reach method where one defines as the loss, the energy of the solution of the problem given by this functional. And also the general uh, Galerki methods or petrov galerki methods where the loss is given by this sum over the residual multiplied by a test function. And then we will vary the particular test functions we select. This is on the interior of the domain and here is on the boundary. Particular cases as are the choices of selecting as VI the residual again. And if you do that, you end up with a deep least square method. In here, you select the volumetric residual, and in here, you select the residual corresponding to the boundary term. Another particular choice is to select as VI to the sign of this residual. And if you do that, you end up with a collocation method. These are the typical pins that we hear so much about. And there is a very interesting world of selecting different uh, functions, test functions here, and then one can integrate by parts once or twice and end up with a weak, ultra-weak formulations and so on. Here we have uh, 
few of the representative papers. There are many, many others, but we couldn't write them all. So we just selected a few of them here, uh, talking about these different formulations and so on. But we wanted to start with something extremely simple. So we selected the first one, this deep reach method. And I told the PhD student to uh, basically copy or do something very similar and try to solve a very simple partial differential equation in 1D, which is basically an OD. And we will obtain some interesting conclusions. Now, so this is the input, this is the X. He built a number of hidden layers with trainable parameters, weights, and biases. You end up with this approximation. Then you impose Dirichlet boundary conditions by multiplying by a function that is zero on the Dirichlet boundary and non-zero everywhere else. And we end up with our solution. And then we need to define the loss, which is given by any of the functional we just mentioned. In this case, this is just the uh, deep reach method. So is this the energy of this function? And we are trying to minimize this energy of the function. OK? So, so far is uh, the same as in the paper by the original paper by Weinan on the deep reach method. Now, we selected a very simple 1D solution, which is x to the power of 0 0.7. This is a singular solution used to test uh, problems in 1D. And these are the corresponding uh, right-hand sides. So uh, we can solve the problem. If we solve the problem, the exact solution will be x to the power of 0 0.7. The energy, that is the best loss function that, that one can obtain for any given solution is this number, minus 1.538. So the objective is to train a neural network and see how we recover this particular number, OK? So we selected this domain, 0 to 10. There's a condition here, Neumann condition there. We divided this into four elements, like infinite elements. And I said, well, select a Gaussian integration rule. And this is going to have far-reaching consequences, not good ones, by the way. And I will show them in a second. So the student did it. And this is the evolution of the loss. So basically, the loss decreases, stays stable around here, and then all of a sudden goes to minus infinity. This is impossible, because the best possible energy is this one, minus 1.538. However, uh, he's obtaining something better than the best possible thing, which means there is an error. So in here, we compare the SAC solution and the approximation we obtained. First of all, the approximation is absolute trash. And the issue is why? Well, you see something very strange going on here. I don't know if you can appreciate it. But in here, we make an amplification. And you see here that there's something going on at this Gauss point, and also here and here. Well, this is where it is happening. At the Gauss points, the derivative of the neural network solution or neural network approximation is pretty much zero. That is, this gradient is zero. That is, the integral of the gradient is being approximated as zero when it is completely false. Because if you realize um, this gradient is not zero at all, I mean, the integral of this is much higher than zero. Nonetheless, it approximates it at zero. And then this neural network is taking, to say, the, the uh, values of the solution are increasing, and they tend to increase more if we leave more epochs, towards infinity. So all of a sudden, this becomes 0, this becomes minus infinity, and this is under control. So the entire energy tends to minus infinity. So where is the problem? The problem is the integration. This approximation of the integral is absolute trash. And this is something that is mentioned in many, many papers, in most of the papers that talk about approximating PDEs with neural networks. But uh, somehow, I felt at, the point, at that moment that it wasn't very much explained or, or very much in detail explained. And as a matter of fact, I think it was yesterday when a person asked Siddhartha Misra when he stuck, uh, 
what happened with the quadrature rule with integration and so on, okay? So we decided to uh, investigate that. And very recently we produced a manuscript that is now in archive and we submitted for publication explaining or, or researching different alternatives to perform this integration, okay? And this is what I will talk about a little bit about Monte Carlo integration, another method that will be based on explainability of neural networks, another one in terms of its adaptive integration, and otherwise another one in terms of piecewise polynomial approximation. <coughs> and as a byproduct of that, I will talk about R adaptivity. Do you have any question? I think someone raised a hand. Uh, yeah, so um, can you just say uh, what activations you uh, consider so far? In here, I was just using ReLU. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thanks. But, but, but at some point we tried different activation functions and it was also very bad. Uh -huh. So okay. you, you say that uh, going from ReLU say to sigmoid or something will not change much? No. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now, Monte Carlo is very simple, basically, uh, although it has many variants. You approximate the integral by uh, the sum of the integrand evaluated at different points, and then you need to determine what is this, the distribution of the variables. Sometimes you can select the uniform or there are more sophisticated choices. It works very well. I would say it's almost the only option for high dimensions, but in low dimensions, the convergence is slow. So we're trying to investigate other options. Now, one option that we found mathematically elegant is the following. Uh, if we select, for example, a midpoint quadrature rule, the quadrature error of function eta, we denote it as eta, is bounded by this quantity. This is from uh, standard uh, theory of uh, functions, of integrals. Now, if we want to control the quadrature error, we need to control that quantity, okay, which is the same as this one. And in this case, our integrand is given by the energy given by the rich functional, the deep rich functional. So what we want is to uh, build a regularizer that bounds the quadrature error for this particular quantity, okay? Now, if you follow the ideas of the uh, paper by uh, Siddhartha Mishra and collaborators for a very simple neural network of one hidden layer, one could construct explicitly those regularizers, okay? And you can find it on, the, on that paper or in the paper we just uh, advertised in uh, archive and that we submitted for publication. If you do that, if you have that quadrature error under control, you can define a new loss function, which is given by this deep rich functional plus this regularizer that bounds the quadrature error. And if you do that, everything is under control, okay? Let me show it with an example, which may be easier to see. Again, this is one dimension. Solution is X squared. And these are the corresponding right-hand side. So solution X square is X square. We selected this solution because it is smooth. And this is, by the way, one of the restrictions of the uh, deep rich method. We need solutions to be uh, smooth, otherwise it doesn't work. And this is our exact solution. And this is our neural network approximation. But more interesting is to see how the loss evolves. So this is the full loss. This is the energy, that is the deep uh, rich energy. And you see that they both go to zero. And there is so small some small separation that corresponds to the value of the regularizer. The value of the regularizer is indicated here in a different scale, so we can see something, okay? It's about 25. So the difference here is also about 25, okay? So basically, at some point, the regularizer controls the quadrature error by not allowing the neural network to produce very uh, 
large or rapid variations on the derivative, okay? And it works to some extent, but to be honest, it has a number of disadvantages. I don't know if it is very practical because <clears throat> if the neural network is complicated, developing this mathematical analysis is uh, highly challenging. You also need regularity in the solution and uh, you need to be sure that your regularizer is sharp enough because if it is not, it will dominate your problem and your uh, approximation will be really bad. So I'm not sure if this is uh, the best method, but it's an alternative. Now, another alternative we tried was the so-called adaptive integration. Basically, in the training data set, uh, we consider a coarse grid and in the validation data set, we consider a fine grid. And then we can select any quadrature rule. And then we can, during training, compare the integral of each element in the training set, in the coarse grid, versus the integral in the validation set, in the fine grid. If those two integrals are equal, then we are fine. If those integrals are very different, we mark those elements for refinement and we refine them. And this is our next training data set and our next validation data set. And these things evolve during the training. Okay? This is very much uh, the version of adaptive integration applied uh, to neural networks. Of course, we are doing it in H by dividing the element size. We could do it in P, we could do HP, any version. And this is what we obtain. It works very well in low dimensions. Of course, in high dimensions, it's not going to work because uh, this is a mesh-based method. Uh, and uh, the next method, it was based on a piecewise polynomial approximation. Basically, what we did is the following. If the SAC solution is given in black, and the neural network approximation is given in red, instead of considering this neural network, we consider a piecewise polynomial approximation of the neural network that, that such that it is equal to the neural network values at the nodes, and in the middle, it is a linear interpolant. Okay, it's a polynomial of degree one. If you do that, again, this is a mesh-based method, so it's good for low dimensions, not for high dimensions. But in particular, you could choose to move the position of the nodes, which is called R adaptivity, when you move the position of the nodes, and is known to be a highly nonlinear problem and very difficult to solve in traditional finite element methods and so on. But in here, since we have neural networks, we can optimize the positions of those <laughs> nodes, of those points, using a neural network, okay? And this is what we did here. So basically, we uh, define a mesh with nodes, and this is a trainable layer. That is, the position of the nodes is trainable. From there, we obtain our quadrature rule. This is non-trainable, because it could be a third-order Gaussian quadrature rule. And then again, as before, hidden layers, post boundary conditions, and define the loss. Okay? Now, when going into this layer, there are two alternatives. One is to move the mesh, but preserve the topology. That is, we move a little bit the points. Okay, from our original mesh to our moved mesh, but preserving the topology. And there's another method which is based on not preserving the topology. That is, we could change this point from here all the way there and switch the order, okay? The difficulty in this second step is that when dealing with neural networks, you need to find the derivative of the remeshing step. You need to find the graph of that, okay? And 
I can talk about that later on, but if it comes to Delaunay triangularizations in 2D or in 3D, uh, it used to be a version that did that because it was implemented in TensorFlow, but not anymore in the latest version. And anyway, we are fighting against that. By the way, we're also hiring people uh, to work on these issues. So if, if any of you is interested, uh, please contact us. This is a small advertisement, okay, on the site. <laughs> it will be very interesting. Now. So this is the, uh, for a very simple example, this is the example we showed before of x to the power of 0 0.7, it's a singular point. And this is the results we obtained. Uh, by the way, we observe a very good approximation and it's incredible how good is this R adaptive grid. It's perfect. Like if you will design it by hand, it would be very much like this. So really good. And, uh, if you consider this exact solution where it has like kind of a boundary layer, this is what we obtain. Again, quite good R adaptive uh, uh, grid. I mean, we obtain a good grid. By the way, we also try the eight adaptivity, in other words, the adaptive integration. And you see all curves are on top. They are very similar. Errors are quite small. And in here we implemented this in 2D using tensor product. In, in other words, we were not remeshing here. We were not changing the topology. We preserved the topology here, okay? If you change the topology, it's much more difficult. And I would try to do it with triangles. It seems simpler than with, uh, than with squares or rectangles. But again, it worked very well and we try other problems and we obtain a good grid. Uh, well, it's an alternative. So, just to sum up, if you are in high dimensions, I think Monte Carlo is the choice because I'm not saying there's no other choice, but at least we couldn't find another one. Perhaps you have some ideas and we'll be more than happy to, uh, to investigate them. But if you're in low dimensions, there are uh, many different alternatives. This one, which is probably mathematically very elegant, but I'm not sure how practical it is, especially in context of large neural networks, or you can use adaptive integration or piecewise polynomial approximations where um, in particular, um, the use of R adaptivity could be useful. It could also be useful to perform R adaptivity, learn from that what are the optimal um, R adapted grids and then use finite elements, for example, with those grids or something like that. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Are there any questions? Yes, Simon. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, so the other methods used in the firm is P adaptivity. Is there an equivalent for that? Uh, yes, definitely. You could use P adaptivity also for the adaptive integration, but in this case, it will be to change the number of quadrature points so the problem with that is that you don't, when you go from a number of quadrature points to a bigger number, you change the position of all points. So you don't reutilize what you already computed, okay? But you could do it perfectly here. And in the piecewise polynomials, for sure, you could do it as well. I mean, I have been working on HP adaptivity for half of my life. So yes, I mean, all of this is extensible to P, HP, and all of that. Okay. I think the next question was by Christoph Schwab. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the talk. Uh, so just maybe first a comment. Um, so the P and HP adaptivity uh, you get uh, when you make the network deeper. So uh, I think your uh, networks have a fixed depth uh, of one or two layers, uh, which you, uh, for the examples which you showed. But when you make it deeper, you get HP type uh, approximation power. Yes, but th this, there are different things. One is the approximation of the space, how well the space of the neural network can approximate your solution. And the other thing is the approximation of the integral. Yeah, here we're, yes, so here when I mean P adaptive, I really mean the integral, the number of quadrature points. Uh, yes, I, I am aware of the uh, difference. Um, yeah, 
this should be done then hierarchically. So uh, you integrate first for a shallow one and then you uh, take into account the hidden layers uh, layer by layer. Yes. Um, but uh, so my question is uh, when you because you come from FEM, uh, so of course in the finite element uh, technology, I would say we are very well uh, familiar with, uh, uh, for example, adaptive mesh refinement. This is a standard stuff which we do in, in engineering courses and, and also mathematically. Now, you uh, in your talk now uh, say the neural network has the fixed uh, somehow architecture is a five nodes or you showed a picture with a five, an example of five nodes. And then you say it is the R adaptivity, uh, which is correct, which then in the training will start reassigning or relocating the nodes. Uh, as part of the training process and, and this corresponds to the R adaptivity. But if you do H adaptivity, so, so uh, like we do it in the finite element uh, technology, this on the neural network side corresponds to growing the network. So, yeah. so instead of working with a fixed architecture, you uh, coming from FEM, you have a rational and well-established methodology to adjust your network architecture, which is, uh, we, we have that. We, we just translate adaptive FEM into a neural network world. And, and then we have a rational and well-proven technology to adapt the neural network architecture to the task at hand. Yes. And, and this is uh, considered quite elusive uh, in the, as far as I know, in the, in the neural network community. <laughs> To have an adaptive uh, sort of architecture adaptation with with certain optimality properties so we coming from fem for these applications which you showed only not not for classification and so on um, we can leverage what we know uh, on the finite element side uh, to uh, bring it to the neural networks yes you could you could really do that i mean and you can uh, make an adaptive architecture so you can increase the number of layers and you get H adaptivity, but you still need to guarantee that the integration error is under control. Because uh, yeah, typically people, what they do is they do a Monte Carlo with that H adaptivity in terms of changing that. Course. So they are, you know, because the H adaptivity you're talking about is for the space to be able to guarantee that you are able to approximate the solution, but yeah. doesn't control the quadrature error. Uh, yeah, but uh, you we have also adaptive quadrature algorithms that you also can translate to neural networks. You mean all of, all algorithmic all algorithmic components which we already have can be translated into the neural network setting. So we have adaptive uh, the trapezoidal rule, adaptive trapezoidal rule, uh, and you can. So so it. the adaptive integration I showed before is basically yeah. that. Yes, basically that. But this is for the integration. Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, you should make the sub network which integrates. Uh, just learn, just make the network learn the numerical integration. Uh, then, okay, you could con you could have two networks: one to yeah, learn the integration sure. and one for the solution. Yes. But then you need to have this under control. The two, the two of them. Yeah, but that's option. the way we should do it. We should translate all blocks of the technology into the neural network world. But basically what you're proposing is some kind of adaptive integration because you know one yeah, that controls the integration, one that controls the other. Yes, this is, yes. this is possible for sure. This is possible. Yeah. It will be a more sophisticated version of the adaptive integration I showed. Exactly. I agree. Yeah? Yes. Um, I see that Simona Appella has a question. So if you could phrase it as short as possible, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for the nice talk. And uh, I have just one question uh, concerning the architecture of uh, your neural network uh, that you showed, uh, I think, in the previous slide, 19 or 18. Ah, that, that one, that one, exactly. So uh, I don't uh, understand why uh, you define, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, the new uh, mesh points 
according to the our adaptive strategy just uh, in the first block uh, if uh, xt depends uh, actually on uh, the solution uh, u because uh, as far as i know uh, you uh, implement uh, an our adaptive strategies uh, a strategy by means of uh, an equidistribution principle uh, and then uh, you need uh, to relocate uh, the points uh, based uh, on uh, your current uh, solution so i don't understand why you have uh, that uh, block xt uh, before uh, computing uh, your uh, numerical uh, uh, solution uh, u and n Okay, this is because uh, basically these are variables. I mean, position of the nodes are just variables that I left them free. In other words, they are a trainable layer. Those are just unknowns. And uh, the solution values are also unknowns. And all I am asking, all I am doing is to minimize the loss. And it will automatically find by doing derivatives, in other words, by building the graph, doing the derivatives and all of that, all these positions and all these uh, values. Oh, okay, As so you, you are not uh, then imposing uh, any explicit uh, equidistribution principle, for example, in uh, 1D or uh, any nothing. other dimension. Okay. I impose nothing. And this is what it is spectacular, or what I find interesting to me, that without imposing anything, it still finds very good R adaptive grids that we know from finite element technology that they are quite good in 1D and in some 2D preliminary problems. I mean, we're still working on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.